Charles Rennie Mackintosh, pioneering Scottish architect, designer and artist. Ian Fleming, British intelligence officer and, later, creator of the famous James Bond novels. Two outstanding figures, working in rather different fields. But what if I told you they were connected by a small green steam engine? Join me as we discover the remarkable story of Count Louis and learn how small trains can connect big personalities. Hello and welcome to the second episode of What Connects? the series that explores unexpected historical connections between historic places, people and artefacts. After all, as the old saying goes, it's a small world. And perhaps nowhere is this more true than in the field of miniature railways. You might think that small trains are a niche hobby, but in fact they've attracted some surprisingly wealthy and well-connected patrons over the years, not to mention talented engineers and designers. One illustrious figure who found himself drawn into this world was Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Born in Glasgow in 1868, Mackintosh was a pioneering artist and architect. He developed a highly distinctive personal style, which combined influences from his native Scotland with elements of Japanese and Art Nouveau design. His work is sometimes interpreted as a precursor to the emergence of the modernist movement. One of his most important clients was Wenman Joseph Bassett Loke, a businessman who made his name selling toys and models, particularly model railways. But he was also an early enthusiast for modernist design, and during 1916-17 to he commissioned Mackintosh to refurbish his house, 78 Derngate, in Northampton. It is the only Mackintosh-designed house in England, and as such, it is now considered to be of international significance. In recent years, it has been fully restored, and it is now open to the public. Bassett Loke also commissioned Mackintosh to produce artwork for his catalogues and other company publications. Bassett Loke is best remembered for selling tabletop model railway equipment, but ride on miniature railways were also becoming popular during the Edwardian period. Bassett Loke therefore decided to start building miniature railway equipment in 15 inch gauge. He asked the famous model engineer Henry Greenley to produce suitable designs for locomotives and coaches. In 1905, Bassett Loke's workshops turned out their first 15 inch gauge locomotive, Little Giant. Over the next few years, Bassett Loke built several more locomotives to this design, and they were put to work on railways at amusement parks and international exhibitions. The Little Giants delighted the Edwardian public, but Henry Greenley wasn't quite satisfied with them. In light of his experience with these early locomotives, he felt that a more powerful and robust design was needed. He therefore designed a slightly larger locomotive, which was called the Sompare class. Incidentally, the name Sompare is French, it means without parallel. Bassett Loke may have chosen this name because it was used by one of the engines which competed against Stevenson's rocket at the Rainhill Trials in 1829. The first two Sompare class locos were completed in 1912, and by the summer of 1914 a third engine of this type was under construction. But when the First World War broke out, the market for miniature railway equipment collapsed overnight. Work on the part-built engine was halted, and the parts were stored at Bassett Loke's works for almost ten years. 
Sadly, 15-inch gauge railways never proved very profitable for Bassett Loke. The market for these big, expensive miniature railways was just too limited. So, after the war, the company decided to focus on smaller gauge railways. But they still had that last, part-built Sompare class loco on their hands. In 1924, they decided to complete the engine and advertise it for sale. Fortunately, a buyer stepped forward, Louis Zabrowski. Despite his Polish surname, Zabrowski was born in England to American parents. He was usually known as Count Zabrowski, but in fact there's no evidence that his family had any claim to an aristocratic title. Nevertheless, his parents were fabulously wealthy. When his mother died in 1911, young Louis inherited a fortune of more than £11 million, along with important land holdings in New York City. He therefore had no need to work for a living, so instead he devoted his time to motor racing. He was an accomplished amateur engineer, and he designed and built his own cars, which were among the fastest and most powerful of their day. But he was also fascinated by railways. In the early 1920s, he visited Bassett Loke's model shop in High Holborn, London, with his friend, the Grand Duke Dimitri of Russia. They fell into conversation with one of the shop assistants, and, as they talked, they began to imagine a vision for the ultimate miniature railway. It would be much more ambitious than Bassett Loke's funfair lines. It would be a real main line in miniature, several miles long, with double track, signalling and a fleet of modern express locomotives. Alas, with the Russian aristocracy having fallen from power in 1917, the Grand Duke Dmitri was in no position to realise such a vision. But the Count had another friend, Captain Jack Howey, who just happened to be one of the richest landowners in the British Empire. Like Zabrowski, Howey was both a racing driver and a railway enthusiast. At some point, Zabrowski must have shared his railway vision with Howie, and together they agreed to turn it into reality. But realising this vision was going to take time, and Zabrowski was obviously itching to start playing trains. So he decided to build a short railway within the grounds of his country house, Higham Park, near Canterbury. When he saw Bassett Loke's advert, for their final Sompare class engine, he snapped it up. The engine was completed and delivered to Hyam in 1924. But then disaster struck. Just a few months later, Zabrowski was killed in a high-speed crash at the Monza Grand Prix. Undeterred, Captain Howey decided to press on and complete their railway project. With Henry Greenlee as his engineer, he constructed the magnificent Romney, Hythe and Dymchurch Railway in Kent. It opened in 1927 and it is still running today. But the RHDR needed much bigger and more powerful engines than Bassett Lokes machines, so Zabrowski's locomotive was surplus to requirements. It was sold by his executors to the Fairbourne Railway in Wales, where it was named Count Louis in honour of its former owner. But what about Zabrowski's racing cars? The Count built a succession of four cars, but they were all given the same name, Chitty Bang Bang. In the early 1920s, Zabrowski raced these cars on the famous track at Brooklands in Surrey. In 1921, his first car, Chitty One, caused a sensation when it clocked speeds of more than 100 miles per hour during its debut race there. Later, his third car, GT3, recorded a lap of more than 112 miles per hour on the Brooklyn circuit. Naturally, these events drew huge crowds, and one of the people who came to watch Zabrowski's cars was a young schoolboy called Ian Fleming. Born in London in 1908, Fleming was the son of a wealthy merchant banker, 
but his father was killed during the First World War. He was a restless young man who tried several different jobs before being recruited into the Naval Intelligence Division in 1939. As personal assistant to Rear Admiral John Godfrey, Director of Naval Intelligence, Fleming was often asked to liaise with other intelligence agencies, including MI5 and MI6. This gave Fleming a wide-ranging knowledge of Britain's intelligence services. After the war, Fleming decided to use his wartime knowledge to develop a series of spy novels. These, of course, became the hugely successful James Bond books, the first of which was published in 1953. But Fleming's final book was a children's novel, based on a bedtime story he had invented for his son, Casper. It was a story about a magic car called Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. OK, he added an extra chitty to the title, but there's no doubt that Zabrowski's cars were Fleming's inspiration. Sadly, Fleming died just before the book was published in 1964, but it nevertheless became a much-loved children's classic. In 1968, it was turned into the famous musical film, starring Dick Van Dyke, and a stage adaptation appeared in 2002. Sadly, only two of Zabrowski's original Chitty Bang Bang cars now survive. Chitty 2 was built on a Mercedes chassis with a Benz engine, and it's now in a private collection in the USA. Chitty 4 was still incomplete at the time of the Count's death, but it was sold to another motor racing driver, J.G. Parry Thomas. He completed the car and renamed it Babs. Alas, tragedy struck again in 1927. Babs crashed during a world speed record attempt at Pendine Sands in Wales, killing Parry Thomas. As a mark of respect, his friends buried the car in the dunes, but it was eventually exhumed and restored in the 1960s. It's now on display in the Museum of Speed at Pendine. Meanwhile, the Count's locomotive remained at Fairbourne until the mid-1980s, when the railway changed hands. By this time, the engine was all but worn out and in need of a major overhaul. It spent many years in storage, but work finally commenced on a major restoration during the late 2000s. It's now back in working order, and it makes occasional appearances at miniature railways up and down the country. It's remarkable that one small locomotive can draw together the lives of so many illustrious individuals. Discovering these unexpected historical connections is exactly what this series is all about. So, if you've enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, and I hope to see you again for a future episode of What Connects. Thank you for watching.